Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for joining the Apprenticeship and Diversity Social Mobility Forum. Apologies for the delay, just had a few technical issues, um, uh, but uh, but we're all sort of sorted now. Um, so welcome and uh, say thank you for joining. We've got a, a, a fabulous sort of set of speakers today, um, some real thought leaders in terms of subjects around ED&I uh, and things connected to sort of social mobility, equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, we are recording, we will be recording and sharing the slides. Um, so uh, so we'll, we'll send a link out as soon as the sort of the, uh, the, the session's over. Um, please use the chat uh, box really for your comments, but um, what we will do is we'll go through the presentations and then any questions you have thereafter, um, please use the chat box for those questions, but any sort of comments you have, whatever, please use the chat box, but questions till after the presentations have finished. Um, and then just last thing really is, is, again, within the chat box, please sort of add in your, your details, your LinkedIn profiles, and anything else that um, that would sort of be useful for other delegates really to, to be able to contact you and, and be involved. So we've had a sort of slight change to the agenda. Um, which is coming up now. So I'll, I'll just do a sort of an introduction into the uh, the social mobility forum, who we are and what we do and what we're about. Then the slight change, we're going to have Ayo Bali from uh, from Barclay and, and Bali to talk about sort of equality, diversity and inclusion from employers and employees perspective. Uh, and then hopefully by that time, we'll have uh, Stephanie Boyce coming in and then we'll have Tony Wilson to talk about employment skills now in the future. And then we'll talk about some of our other initiatives in terms of, sort of the festival of apprenticeships we've got a couple of videos regarding that and then the multicultural apprenticeship alliance and the uh, the multicultural apprenticeship awards that have gone live as well and then so sort of just before one o'clock i'll sort of just have some thoughts and wrap up and, and close and see what the next steps next steps are so this is the empowering futures um apprenticeship diversity and social mobility forum We've titled it Navigating Diversity, Inclusion, Equity and Social Mobility. So what the, what the forum is about really is just challenging, challenge sort of thoughts, perspective, perceptions and perspectives around ed &I and social mobility. What are the issues um, and how can we really um, have, a, have a call to action really and, and, and make an impact within this agenda? So we try and get sort of thought leaders on a platform dedicated to sharing knowledge. Um, and we have some real knowledgeable people um, today. And to get involved, as I say, once this is finished, if you if you would like to present or be part of the Social Mobility Forum, then please get in contact with me. And so this is the second one. So I've been in, in sort of post six months. So this is the second one that I've done. The first one, we had um, the Open University, uh, uh, an SME called Ian Girl Solutions, uh, and then the Social Mobility Commission as well, who were part of that. And, and it was a great, great forum attended by about 100 people. I think today we've got close to that amount. Um, and then the second one today, as I say, we, we've got uh, some great guest speakers as well. So without further ado, what I'll do is I'll hand you to across to Io, who will be doing a presentation on EDI. and So welcome and thank you very much, Io, for attending. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, just getting my slides up. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm glad that um, people are now able to hear us. Um, I think if there's any technical issues, I think there's some um, some words in the chat to say it's just a matter of refreshing it and hopefully you'll be able to um, hear there. Can I just ask uh, if people can see my slides, by the way, first of all, because I've just attempted to share. but I'm, I can't see them, so I just want to double check. People can see them? No. Nope. Okay. Not yet. Okay. All right. I think um, I think the presenter needs to stop sharing if I want to share the media. So I'm, I'm not sure if uh, colleagues behind the scenes can just help me uh, with that to get my slides up uh, in the background. If you could share them for me, that'd be great. Or I'll try again. Right, just trying to share again. 
All right, something's coming up. Brilliant, we're there. There's no great event without a couple of technical glitches <laughs> at the beginning, so forgive me for that. But um, trust me, you're in for a really good uh, treat um, this morning in terms of the speakers uh, that are coming um, after me in particular. But first of all, I'm really, really privileged to be here. So I'd just like to thank Jagdeep and the rest of the team at um, this forum for inviting me to speak. My name's Ayo Bali, um, and I run a consultancy based in Liverpool that works uh, globally to really support and advance um, equity, diversity and inclusion. So we're in really good company. I know everyone here today is really passionate, particularly about improving diversity oh. um, in apprenticeship programmes. And I'm going to talk specifically yep. a little bit about my personal experience being from a working class background and a racially minoritised background in terms of how that's impacted uh, my career and my advancement, but also more so um, from your perspective um, to allow a bit of reflection in terms of what you, uh, feel yes, I can you're see. doing um, within your organisation and what you could do differently oh, no, perhaps twice. to advance equity so that people um, from who kind of come into your organisations from diverse backgrounds really have the opportunity uh, to thrive within it as well. So um, I actually established Bakery Bali yes. back in 2021. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Martin. Really Thank you. It essentially uh, because of the Black Lives Matter movement and yeah. also everything that was going on in society, particularly yes. around Thank COVID-19 and the impact that that was having on um, minority uh, ethnic uh, communities across the UK as well. There was a real call to action. I think we, we can all agree globally that there was a need to do more uh, and organisations were really approaching me for support in terms of what they could do to recruit and importantly, improve the experience of uh, staff who were coming from racially minoritized backgrounds. So that's kind of the core for why we established. And what we do is really try and drive culture change by not only um, providing training, but importantly, creating strategies that are long-term within organizations. So these changes that we need in terms of improving representation and improving um, uh, career progression opportunities and diversity can be embedded. They're not something that are just, that's just gonna be the focus of the year. It needs to be something that's long to embedded in uh, strategy. So that's our, our clear uh, vision really in terms of how we approach this work. We also offer a number of uh, video podcasts as well. So um, if you are interested in EDI, um, we bring together um, uh, expert practitioners um, as part of our community. And we're really here to create a ripple effect and work with others so that they can actually improve inclusion in their own settings. So we're on a mission. Um, we want to improve equity. And it's interesting, uh, particularly that um, this year's International Women's Day theme is embracing equity. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in, in the presentation. But we really want to um, redistribute power and look at how we can change some of the power structures that historically have kept people from lower socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, but also from racially minoritized backgrounds and other underrepresented groups out of the workplace. And we do that by, by really working in partnership with organisations to hear the voices that are not necessarily always heard. Um, and we also do a lot around recruitment, retention, learning and development and strategic development, as I've mentioned. So there's loads and loads of stats out there that I'm sure um, most people on the call will be really familiar with in terms of why this is really positive for business. My own view is actually looking from a values perspective and the fact that this is the right thing to do is the priority when we start to look at EDI. But there's lots of information out there, so much evidence to show that diverse teams are better at making decisions. So actually having people from different socioeconomic backgrounds different uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds in our organisations are better for, for our own progression as companies. Um, also focusing on these issues of equality and diversity helps us reduce some of the workplace ha harassment um, that we see, unfortunately, for many uh, minoritised people within the workplace. And also um, there's a massive um, uh, correlation in terms of profit. So there's, there's endless evidence out there really in terms of why this stuff is important. Um, however, unfortunately, on the other side, we're still in a position that it's going to take another 216 years, according to a recent report, for us to have firms um, in the UK that are reflective of our ethnic diversity. So we have to constantly and consistently ask ourselves why that is, and also to understand that the lived experience, particularly 
of um, ethnically or racially minoritized groups is still that there are much higher proportions um, around uh, racism, experiences of racism in the workplace. And that is in 2021. And I'm sure that um, the speakers today will be touching on um, issues around that um, to, to actually understand um, what those issues are and, and the impact of them. So although we know that this is the right thing to do, we're still seeing a real struggle in terms of making uh, the difference and the change happen. Now, there's no presentation that's complete without a really, really embarrassing childhood picture. I've done my best to clumsily um, kind of uh, cover the faces of some of my uh, classmates. You'll probably be able to tell which one of these people, uh, which one of these children is me when I was at first school. I'm the incredibly awkward looking uh, girl on the back row, the tallest in my class, hyper visible and desperately trying to um, fit in and also minimise myself as well. Um, I felt at school I was really, really visible, uh, but for all the wrong reasons. And as I say, I, I work it, kind of growing up in a, a very working class white area of Bradford, um, I always felt that I was othered and different. Uh, but happily, um, I do have a twin brother. He was in the class with me. So that gave me a little bit of esteem there. And you can see him looking really pleased with himself. And the reason that I wanted to share this picture although it's embarrassing, is just to let you know a little bit about my background and why this issue of social mobility and using EDI as a way to really improve social mobility is so pertinent and so important. I actually come from uh, the fifth most um, income deprived local authority in England and the sixth most employment deprived local authority in England. And that's out of over 300 local authorities. So um, my own background is that my dad came to the UK from Nigeria. He proudly says with only 20 pounds in his pocket. Um, my mum was a dinner lady and a cleaner. She left school at 16. Um, so in terms of aspirations and role models in terms of social mobility, it wasn't really necessarily natural to me or around me. And I was aware from a very young age that not only my gender and my uh, working class background, but also my ethnic origin was also going to hamper me in terms of my uh, career progression and my progression through school as well. I experienced a lot of um, kind of lower expectations. Um, uh, and I think this is something that's quite common for a lot of people. So for me, this stuff is really personal. And I think that organisations can do a lot to make sure that people, no matter what their socioeconomic background, um, can progress. And I wanted to share um, another little bit um, from, from my family. So uh, you saw the little boy there, my, my twin brother on the picture. He, um, he has a, been able to really progress um, in terms of his social mobility. And um, for me, he's, he's like one of my heroes in terms of a success story. Um, he's kind of defied a lot of stereotypes, a lot of microaggressions and a lot of lower expectations um, to be a writer in The Guardian. And that didn't happen on purpose. It was something that was massively intentional. And it really relied on his employer developing a positive action program specifically for working class young people from racially minoritized backgrounds to be able to tap into his talent. And he was recently um, referenced in the recent um, Meghan and, and Harry Netflix um, program. I've not watched it myself. I don't know if anyone on the call has watched it. Feel free to let us know if it's, if it's worth a watch. Um, but he was referenced there talking um, about Harry's experience of a kind of the uh, awakening that he had around unconscious bias and the fact that there's not enough education on that. Um, and he's also recently uh, been part of um, a really high profile auction in terms of um, getting a, a publisher for his um, uh, book that will be released next year, which is looking at black uh, hidden black Britain, uh, black British stories um, from outside of London as well. So he's, I suppose, an example from, from my family of how um, focusing on equality, diversity and inclusion can really, really help social mobility and ensure that organisations are, are widening the gate. It's not that they're lowering the bar, it's about enabling more people from different backgrounds to actually enter um, the workforce and to really tap into their talent and their different perspectives on life as well that make things so much more vibrant. But that's not the whole story. I think that it's important when we start to think about our own organisations, particularly people on this call who are interested in apprenticeships and making sure that um, people going into apprenticeships are from more diverse backgrounds. It's super important to make sure that those organisations that they're going into have a real clear understanding of EDI and understand the different elements. So if we look at, for instance, diversity, if we have diversity, but we don't have equity within our organisations that people are coming into, then we're going to see um, 
the same kind of homogenous um, backgrounds in terms of the people that are at leadership positions. And there's lots of evidence in a number of sectors that um, people from racialized backgrounds or in certain sectors, women will get to a certain stage in their career. And then there's a glass ceiling or in some respects, a concrete ceiling that people can't get through. And that's because of a lack of equity. So diversity without equity doesn't give us um, much progress when it comes to the experiences of people who've been historically marginalized. Similarly, with inclusion, if we have an inclusive organization that feels good, where people feel valued, but we don't have diversity, then we don't have the cultural competency within our organizations to understand the different experiences of people. So it's important to both be inclusive, but also try and be diverse as well, get other people and different perspectives into that good organization. And finally, if we have a sense of equity, which is the real core of, uh, of this piece for me, it's that redistribution of uh, power. It's, it's having policies and procedures that invite people with disabilities to be able to participate uh, equally within the workplace. If we have equity, but we don't have a sense of inclusion, then we'll get to the stage where people don't necessarily want to stay within the organization because they don't necessarily feel valued even though they've been given a great position so it's important really i guess the key message from this is to make sure that in our organizations we're looking at each piece uh, both individually but also as a homogenous uh, and uh, holistic group as well um, so that we can be authentic, so that we can make sure that those uh, apprenticeships who come within our organisations are really valued and become and are an essential uh, part of the team as well. So uh, lots to think of. But now what I'm going to do is pause for breath slightly. Um, I mentioned that this is going to be interactive and we've got loads of people on the call. Um, so I'd be really, really curious to ask you just two questions. So if you go to the poll setting, um, you should see it. It looks like a graph. Um, there should be um, a poll in there. There should be two questions, actually. So the first question is, I want to know if you feel your organisation is currently making proactive efforts around EDI. And don't necessarily just focus on the apprenticeship element. Think about the wider workforce. Um, this is completely anonymous. There's no judgment. Just really curious to see what people uh, say, whether they agree that their organisation is proactively working on this or whether they're, they're not. And I can see the votes coming in at the moment. Not sure if everyone else can see, but the majority of people, nearly 70% of people who've responded so far, say that their organisations are uh, proactively making efforts in this with um, uh, about around 25% saying that they slightly agree. So the vast majority of people on the call today, unsurprisingly, which is great, are saying that organisations are proactively uh, looking um, at this agenda. So we've got a second question as well. And um, so if you um, if you scroll down, you should see the second question, which is um, I also want to know for those organisations, particularly that are doing um, making efforts around um, improving equality and diversity in their whole workforce. How many people on the call feel that they're actually starting to see some positive impact? Are you visibly seeing more diversity within the organisation at all levels? Are you seeing a sense of retention where people feel that they're staying? Does there feel that there's a good and inclusive culture as a result of some of this work? So again, honest, um, answer openly and honestly, everything's anonymous, just interested to see what people feel who've dialed in today. So we can see um, so far that around 60% of people who've responded say that um, they can slightly agree. So, um, and around 35% say that they agree that they're starting to see positive change with very few uh, saying that they disagree. So that's really positive. And I think um, when we look at some of the statistics that I shared at the beginning of the presentation, um, that gives me hope and it gives me joy um, that some um, individuals are starting to see um, some really positive changes. And please do use the chat um, to share. If you've got any particular initiatives that you're doing that you're particularly proud of, please do share those in the chat so that we can really use this um, to share knowledge and exchange details of what we're doing as well. So just moving on, and just before I finish, um, from my experience of working um, uh, in equality and diversity now for the last um, 18 years, what I really wanted to do was to share what I feel are the key ingredients to getting this right. Um, so if you're in an organisation where you don't feel that there's been much effort or that there's been some effort, but it's stalling, this will hopefully give you a little bit of inspiration and insight of where you can um, kind of look in terms of going back to basics. 
And I think the first thing is that um, at Bakery Bali, we look at things very much through a social justice perspective. So for me, it all starts with understanding. So ask yourself, is your organisation aware of what it feels like to be kind of feeling like you're at um, part of an other group, whether that's because you're from a different social class than most people, whether you're a, a woman in a most, mostly male environment or any other um, element of, of your identity. What, what does it feel like to be underrepresented or um, um, from a minority group within your organisation? And the way that you can do that is through surveys, focus groups and asking the question really regularly, not only with your staff and your apprenticeships that you have, but also potentially with um, your clients and your customers as well. You want to know that your organisation is really relatable. So if you want to advance in this area, definitely go back to basics and understand how people feel now. Ask questions and be open to listening, even when some of the messages that you hear back are quite difficult to digest. I think secondly from that, it's really important to develop your own very specific vision and priorities that are bespoke to your organisation. So it might be within your, your organisation, you feel that you want more um, generational diversity. It might be that you've had a look at your employee group and you're not representative of people who are at the older age, uh, age end of the age spectrum. It could be that you're not um, doing great in terms of recruiting people with disabilities, whether they're visible or non-visible. So the important thing is to actually have a vision. What is it that you want to do and why does it matter to your organisation? Going back to that values base and ask yourself, are you actually sending that message out publicly? Is there a message on your website talking about the fact that you um, you care about equality, diversity and inclusion and that you're on a mission to uh, really widen the uh, gate in terms of people who have access to jobs within your organisation? If you're not making those statements on every job application form on your website, ask yourself why not? Because if you don't start sharing that, people won't start to understand it and see you as an employer that can embrace um, and progress people of all backgrounds. I think the next thing is thinking about the capacity and capability. So I think a, a lot of the reasons that um, that I've seen EDI um, strategies fail is because of a lack of resource or a lack of capability and confidence. So don't underestimate the importance of training. I think that's really important, particularly for managers and creating a safe space to talk about sensitive issues around bullying, harassment, identity, uh, lack of career progression. It's really important to, to have those opportunities so that people feel confident and capable and they understand how that training actually links back to the organization's vision and values around improving diversity. And I think finally, what I'd leave with you is um, a focus on accountability. So again, ask yourself who is actually accountable for improving uh, equity to make sure that people from different socioeconomic backgrounds can progress, not only that they can enter, but that they can progress. Do you have any key performance indicators around that? Like with any other area of business, you generally measure and have a goal, set goals, set stretch goals. Are we being ambitious enough? And if you feel that you're not, how can you have a conversation internally to look at how you can develop an accountability structure so people cl clearly know what they can do to help the organisation improve um, the uh, social mobility, particularly um, with apprenticeships, but also throughout the rest of the organisation. So for me, those are the key ingredients, I think, that link um, EDI um, and social mobility. So just to finish up, um, um, I wanted to leave you with a quote um, from an author that I've been reading uh, recently, Lily Zeng, um, who's the author of DEI Deconstructed. Uh, she talks about accountability in, in, in EDI as both the informal, but also the formal mechanisms by which organisations and its leadership are held to task um, uh, on, to achieve what they commit to. And I really like this quote because it talks about the informal mechanisms. And I think more and more organisations uh, need to be asking each other informally, where are we advertising this role? Why is it that we haven't got representation around the table of people of different backgrounds? Do we need to develop a scheme or actually change um, our career progression structure and processes to actually make them much more inclusive of people with disabilities or from a racially minoritized backgrounds or whatever um, group within your organization is uh, underrepresented. So it's both the formal mechanisms through the policies and the, and the practice, but also it's the conversations, making this a key part of the conversation ongoing and making this an everyday uh, part of the thought process as well is really important for making that change happen. 
So thanks for listening. I hope you've got um, something out of that presentation in terms of why this matters to me, um, but also um, how equality and diversity and inclusion can really help social mobility within apprenticeships, not just get, getting people within apprenticeships, but also ensuring that companies are inclusive and are really going to be ethically able to support and progress um, individuals of different backgrounds um, who've traditionally been underrepresented to progress within their organisation. What I'd like to do is just let you know, um, if you do want any further resources, please do have a look at my website, do add me on LinkedIn. We do have regular podcasts, as I mentioned, and you can also download um, a free copy of our diversity calendar as well, which might be useful for your workplace if you don't already have one, just to identify the different points within the year that we can really acknowledge um, diversity within, uh, within our society and the people that we want represented within our organisations. So thank you very much, and I'll um, I'll hand back to um, Jagdeep, and also happy to take any questions if anyone has any for me. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Really, really insightful. Um, uh, we've got a comment from Matt Poynton, um, who's uh, from the TUC, saying they have an anti-racism task force, which is a partnership between management and the union committee. That has done some really good work. So that sounds um, a great piece, really, of, of, of best practice. Um, does Does anybody have any questions for you? Just want to put them in the chat. That's some good good comments. You know, some great insights uh, from Anthony Adams. Great presentation. Um, I don't think we we do. I, I've sort of got one. You, know, you, you may have mentioned this within the uh, within your presentation, but I'm just sort of wondering. You know, are there elements of sort of best practice that you've seen, or any real sort of substantive changes within sort of EDI within organisations, and, and and what that was in terms of how they these organisations went about that. Yeah, I think in terms of best practice, definitely, I think over the last uh, few years, as, as people have become more aware of the structural nature of inequality and the structural nature of racism, people have been more um, aware of the need to actually look at their um, procedures and actually de-bias those structures. So when we look at recruitment, people are now starting to look through, at that through a completely different lens and turn things on its head, really, in terms of actually, if we're not uh, recruiting people from certain backgrounds, why is that? Is it something to do with the way that we're actually actively recruiting? Do we need to do things completely differently? So I think organisations' willingness to actually um, do the work around changing their structures to incorporate more people from different backgrounds is really is really good. I think also organisations using um, positive action as well to um, identify that they can really reach out and, and proactively reach communities that are underrepresented and that's something that's legal. I think if you can identify in the last 12 months that within your organisation a certain group are underrepresented, you can proactively go out um, and encourage um, people from those backgrounds to apply, provide career opportunities uh, for them so that they can um, become part of your organisation. So I think um, a lot of organisations are starting to become super innovative and just thinking outside the box, really, which is great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, a couple of other comments saying really informative um, and it's been fabulous, fabulous presentation. And and, and thank you, Ayo. Um, thank you for joining it's us. Good to be here. Yeah, <laughs> great. So I'll share my slides now. So it does just take a second to uh, it's not allowing me to share for some reason. So next we'll have um, I, Stephanie Boyce, who's the first um, black female president of the Law Society um, on stage. So we're really honoured and privileged to have 
uh, Stephanie as part of the Apprenticeship Diversity and Social Mobility Forum. And then Joe Hughes, Joanna Hughes from uh, Joanna Hughes Solicitor Apprenticeships, um, again, who has extensive, extensive experience within sort of the, the law field, um, and she'll be chairing this session and interviewing uh, Stephanie. So welcome, guys. Thank you very much again for joining Hi. us. A real honour and privilege. Um, and I will come off stage now. Take it away. I've been looking forward to this. Um, um, I will I will say for you, um, Stephanie, that Stephanie is the immediate past president of the Law Society. Um, and also, I really hope that people are going to get something out of this that they might not have heard before in other interviews, because although originally I was a huge fan, I am still a huge fan of uh, Stephanie's work. I introduced myself to her slightly cringingly as a fangirl, didn't I? Um, but now we're friends as well. And so I hope there'll be a slight more... Um, degree of informality to this interview whilst we are addressing some very serious and important topics. So do you want to say anything before we start or should we just kick off with my questions? Should we kick off with some questions? Yeah. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah. Great. So my first question um, addresses your journey um, mm. and you said in an interview and I really love this quote which is why I picked it out um, with the Financial Times in July 2021. I've long spoken about my own situation. Some people ask why I talk about it. I'm not embarrassed. It's important that people appreciate and realise that coming from a non-traditional background from a low socioeconomic starting position you can still reach the top of your profession can you tell us a bit about your childhood and your parents and that quote absolutely so uh, i'm first generation british uh, you know my parents my grandparents come into this country the united kingdom from the caribbean that they say i say in search of faith hope and greater opportunities and uh, both my parents, my father uh, left education at the age of 12, my mother uh, completed school um, and, and for a number of reasons, neither one went on to, um, uh, to achieve um, qualifications thereafter. But if I take you slightly back to my grandfather who came to this country in 1960 um, and my grandfather who was illiterate, you know, most of that born about by the fact that he was, our family was poor. Um, you know, couldn't afford to put shoes on his feet. He went to school with holes in his clothes. And because of that embarrassment, he didn't go to school and hence he was not able to read and write. But he told us we were to make something of ourselves. He didn't say what, um, but we were to make something of ourselves. And I think that would stay with me for a long time. But also, you know, thinking about growing up in a single household on a council estate, um, and not having access to those networks or the social capital to withdraw from, as I, as I say, um, meant that I had to navigate my way through a number of obstacles, um, learning as I went along um, and trying to get over or sidestep those obstacles to get to where I've got to today. And my story and the reason why I tell it is, and as I was explaining to colleagues I was speaking to a couple of days ago, when they were saying that, you know, they're slightly a bit embarrassed about their background um, and when others have made assumptions why they have chosen not to correct them um, and I say well why you know um, mine is a badge of honour if you like I'm not embarrassed because my lived experiences my journey my starting point has been instrumental in getting me to where I've got to today and when a family friend asked me the other day they said Stephanie when you were a little girl, you know, growing up on Prebendal Farm, which is the name of the estate in Aylesbury, Buckinghamshire, where I grew up, she said, did you know you would grow up to become the president of the Law Society of England and Wales? And I thought about it for a moment and I said, you know, and I could thinking back to that little girl with that big afro, you know, and I said, of course not. I, I, don't, I don't even think I knew a lawyer at that point. Um, other than what I saw on television on the odd occasion. So no, I didn't think um, that I would grow up to become president, but I knew with the words of my grandfather in, the, in my mind that I would grow up to, to be something, I would do something with my life. That's lovely, that's such a lovely answer, thank you. Um, 
and as you know, I'm from a low socioeconomic background as well. And, and in my field, I talk a lot about it as well, because I think it is important that we talk about it. There's absolutely no reason to be embarrassed. And I hold it as a badge of honour too. OK, question two uh, about ED&I and equity of opportunity in the legal profession or that lack thereof at the moment. Um, throughout your presidency, you said it was your mission to leave the solicitor profession more diverse and inclusive than the one you entered. Can you tell us a bit about why you decided to focus on socioeconomic diversity, please? Well, absolutely. Can I firstly say it remains my mission to leave the profession more diverse and inclusive uh, than the one I entered. And somebody said to me the other day, when are you leaving? <laughs> I'm not leaving the profession anytime soon. But but absolutely. <laughs> um, so you, you just heard my story in terms of my background. So. For me, social mobility uh, straddles so many different characteristics. You know, in my mind, if you're poor, you're poor. And that is not to uh, discount the other characteristics. They're not less important at all. But, you know, um, for me, in 21st century Britain today, your background, where you come from, your starting point in life, um, still leads to differences in opportunities, progression, and so forth. And of course, yes, all of the character, other characteristics still lead to differences um, and uh, uh, play a, a part in career progression. But the UK has one of the poorest social mobility uh, rates in the developed world. And that means people from uh, low income families, regardless of their uh, talent, their hard work, and so forth, um, do not have access to the same opportunities as those born into more privileged circumstances. They do not possess that social capital, that currency that I spoke about. Um, and so for me, it was important to highlight uh, the work um, that needed to be done in this area, with 23% of solicitors coming uh, from a privately educated background as opposed to 7% of the wider UK population. So. When I was given the opportunity to speak about it and tell my story, um, absolutely I did. And I could have created this, this, this backstory, this scenario that would have played into lots of different things, but I was being authentic. I wanted to be true to myself um, and to others and to those I served. So as president, I was absolutely proud. I remain proud of the work um, the way the profession galvanised itself around this topic, the work that we're doing, the way that it has filtered out into other areas um, and the work that we continue to do and the progress with a recognition that more still needs to be done. Of course, we have made great strides, but the work is not done. The work will continue. And that's why I continue post-presidency to do all I can to highlight not only around social mobility, but the inequalities, the injustices that continue to prevail in this country, because as I said, you know, skills, ability, aptitude, they must be the defining uh, factors, not race, not gender, sexuality, uh, disability or any other characteristic that they don't, they should not come into this. And I can't wait to talk about your future plans. I'm saving that till last. Um, but let's um, let's delve in a little bit deeper about role modelling, um, because you and I both worked on the government commissioned City of London Socioeconomic Diversity Task Force, um, which concluded in November last year. And one of the key things you and I both heard repeated over and over again, and is being put out by the task force's recommendations, is the importance of senior people in the financial and professional services, including law, being visible and vocal role mm -hmm. models. Um, can you just say a little bit more about the importance of role modelling? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I have to tell this story. So when I was campaigning to uh, become uh, president um, on, on, you know, on the fourth occasion, because uh, it took me four attempts to be successfully elected, um, as you start off being elected as deputy vice president, and then it's an automatic trajectory to go on to become president as I did in March, 2021. And uh, we were at Hustings. And the night before Hustings, I had been given, a, we council had been given a report and in that report, it gave me every statistic why, as a black female in the solicitor profession, why I, we are the least likely to succeed in the profession. 
So the question that somebody asked was, if you are successful, how will you promote equality and diversity and inclusion in the profession? And I thought about that report and all the statistics it gave me. I thought about the cohort of colleagues in front of me who were going to vote for me. I'd also written in big capital letters the word SMILE. I looked at that paper and I thought to myself, I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I do. What am I going to say? And with big smile on my face, I said, how am I going to promote equality, diversity and inclusion? I'm going to role model it. I'm going to be visible. Um, and that resonated with so many people. And that's why I spent my time as president, well, actually as an office holder, I continue to spend my time being visible, um, connecting with people, speaking about issues, um, showing individuals that actually you can you can do it. If I did it, anyone can do it. Um, it's important that we have those aspirations um, uh, and we put ourselves forward. Uh, you know, and put our heads above the parapet. Um, so role models are absolutely important and, you know, and they can be anyone. Um, they can be, in our, they're found everywhere in our homes. You know, um, any one of us can name uh, a role model. Thank you. And then before I move on to the next question, um, I just want to thank you from me and on behalf of the profession for being such an incredibly visible um, a president when you were president and continuing your work. Um, you know my own personal view, we've discussed it many times before, is I'd never seen a, a president of the Law Society of England and Wales be so visible before and what you did with that visibility um, was, was seismic change and um, we're all incredibly grateful. That's very gushing but it's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on to my favourite topic, um, legal apprenticeships. The first time I met you was one month into your presidency when you kindly attended, in typical you fashion, an in-person conference of a social mobility charity that I'm patron for, which is called Grow Mentoring. And you delivered the keynote speech. And, and I can't overstate actually what a huge impact that had on the aspiring solicitors attending. You know, they and you were so kind, you even let them do selfies with you and they shared them with such pride and excitement. And I felt that sort of change starting at, at that moment actually. And then the next time I um, saw you in person was when you again kindly agreed to meet with a group of solicitor apprentices that I'd brought together to have lunch with you. Um, and since then we've stayed in close touch about all things solicitor apprenticeships and careers education. Um, why, why do you care about this issue so much? Solicitor, first of all, solicitor apprenticeships for me is, you know, it's my mission, one of my many missions, but my mission to raise awareness around this route, this alternative route, this, this other route into uh, the profession, because A, not much is uh, being done about it, um, in, or not much is, sorry, is known about it rather than being done about it. And of course, Joe, I'm going to ask you to share uh, in a few moments the work that you've been doing uh, with uh, um, city firms, because I think it's important um, that we highlight that work as well. But solicitor apprenticeships allows you the opportunity. And of course, we heard from AO and we, and we no doubt we'll hear from others around why apprenticeships are important. Solicitor apprenticeships, and my understanding is also that there is an apprenticeship being worked on for barristers, um, which is great as well. But it provides you that opportunity to earn whilst you learn, or somebody said a free degree as well, although you don't have to uh, do a, a solicitor apprenticeship with a degree. Um, but it gives you that option to do uh, um, the, come into the profession whilst training um, at six years or whichever where you come into it, six years, training and getting a degree, um, being paid for uh, the degree, being paid for the training, being paid for and you're getting paid. So you don't leave with that massive debt. And of course, lots of young people I speak to are concerned, especially in the current climate, are absolutely concerned with the level of debt that they may, may leave university uh, with. So this provides an option, but not much is known about it. And in fact, I've been having conversations with the SRA um, and the LSB. And can I say I'm grateful uh, to uh, colleagues, the, 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 the CEO of the SRA and chair and the chair of the LSB for having those conversations with me about actually we need to be given more visibility 
to uh, solicitor apprenticeships. And we also need to think about, uh, you know, uh, in res respect of who's minding, if you like, quote unquote, solicitor apprentices, because I do think that the regulatory arm could be doing more in that space. But Joe, can you tell us about the work that you've been doing? Well, I would love to, you know that. <laughs> um, so actually, thank you for asking. Uh, uh, yesterday was a, a really big moment for us. Um, so the work I do while I'm director of solicitor apprenticeship, uh, Joanna Hughes Solicitor Apprenticeships, I also have a role on the City of London Law Society, together with Patrick McCann, who's the chair of that committee. And between us, we have been encouraging city law firms to introduce the solicitor apprenticeship route to the profession if they don't already have it. Uh, and yesterday, I am very, very pleased to say that in one room, we had 50 Five zero city law firms all meeting together to discuss this. This is really huge and unprecedented. Um, and we've had people such as Colin Passmore, who's chair of the entire president um, of uh, chairman of the Law Society, City of London Law Society, saying things such as, you know, this is seismic change. This is a real game changer. So it's very, very exciting. Um, and there's lots of uh, work to do there. Uh, and thank you for supporting, uh, lending your supporting voice. I've just picked up, I'm just going to go off script for a minute because I've picked yes. up something in the questions, which we can come back to in the questions mm -hmm. section. But it was about how some people um, are tired of being um, positioned as black role models, etc. And that's why I said, I think, you know, when I was talking about how impactful you were and how visible you were as um, president when you were president of the Law Society in New England Wells, it actually had nothing to do with your race. You were just more visible than any other president I've ever seen in my 25 year um, career as a, as a lawyer. But we can come back to that later in the questions section. Um, okay, let's talk about um, what the future should be in terms of the legal profession, ED and I. Um, and something that you had done, which I don't think had been done before as the Law Society president, was you um, you organised a presidential gala dinner, which I attended, and it was amazing, and the speeches were amazing, to raise money for three charities. Do those charities that you chose indicate where you think the future should be in terms of focus of ED and I well, in the legal profession? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. So in respect of the time as well, uh, you know, so the three charities, Law Care um, around, you know, Law Care supports and, 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 and works with mental health and well-being, the Sutton Trust around social mobility and um, Access to Justice Foundation, which is exactly what it says it, it, it does, Access to Justice. Um, and for me, those were the nominated charities that I chose not only to support my presidential plan, but also to raise awareness around the work that they were doing, because you know we were coming out of, um, and in fact, when I first chose them, I wasn't aware that actually you know the pandemic hadn't set in yet, because I became DVP in 2019. Um, but the whole point was I knew that they were doing remarkable work, um, continue to do remarkable work, and yes, I wanted to shine a spotlight on the work that they were doing. Um, and that's not, again, to discount anything that others are doing, but, um, but, but their work really came into the fore when the pandemic set in, uh, you know, when lots of us were locked down at home and perhaps our mental health started suffering. It was to, to absolutely shine the spotlight on the work that they were doing, to talk openly about mental health and well-being. I spoke about the challenges of being locked down at home, you know, spending Christmas on my own, um, having the food, you know, dropped off on my doorstep. And we all have our own stories about the experiences that we faced um, and the challenges um, during that period of uh, in time in our lives. Um, and no doubt, you know, those will be stories that we will continue to tell for years to come and so forth. But there are a number of areas um, that those three charities do expand in, but it's not to suggest, I think, in terms of DNI, there is so much, you know, um, so it's not to suggest that those three areas are, is entirely where it should be at or where I see the future, because I think actually every characteristic and all and, and new challenges that are coming to the fore all deserve to have a spotlight shone on uh, uh, the work that those individuals, remarkable people do, 
to give up their time um, to, to, to help others. And more so than ever, this is a time where help, you know, um, volunteering, um, you know, is needed. Um, and I always say one of my favourite phrases, I always say, because when I was president, every week I put out a weekly uh, email to the volunteer community, uh, personally written by me. Um, and I always ended it with a positive quote. And one of my favourite ones was, in a world where you can be anything, be kind. Yes. Yes, indeed. In fact, a very good friend of mine, I bought him a T-shirt with that on and he wore it on the Lorraine breakfast show this week when he was interviewed. He's oh, so yeah. you're in very good company of, in, of liking that quote. I have to give you give you one of my gifts with that on it. Um, so let's move to the future. Um, I saw a press release last month um, that you are going to work as an ed and I advisor at the large international law firm of Linklaters. And I should add here that I am a very big fan of Linklaters. Um, we've already spoken about Patrick McCann, who works there, but also their managing partner, Paul Lewis, who um, I've had dealings with in relation to apprenticeships and social mobility, um, a wonderful firm. Mm. Um, could you tell us a bit more about this role and your immediate plans? Absolutely. So yes, I'm, I've joined uh, Linklaters as a strate strategic advisor to um, uh, assist them with their, uh, their race plan, their ED and I work. Um, but lots of people ask me why Linklaters. Um, I think for me, Linklaters is a well-known, respected uh, global firm, and they are doing, have done such remarkable work, um, and their reach is incredible. And uh, w when they first approached me and asked me, you know, would I come and work with them? Um, it was almost, you know, I thought about it and I thought about that reach, you know, um, and the continued work that's being done. And that's not to discount, again, anything else that I might be involved in, because like yourself, um, you know, and, and we recently visited a school together where we did, you know, a careers fair. Um, and all the other things that, that you know, uh, that this work allows me to continue to do. But for me, um, I still have to take a breath because from that young child growing up in that single parent household on a council estate to now becoming president, to now going on to be a strategic advisor at one of the world's biggest global firm, um, it still takes my breath away. Wow. I can't think of anyone better um, suited to be that role than you. They're very lucky to have you. OK, very quick fire question to finish. I hope this doesn't embarrass you too much. OK, lots and lots of awards and accolations. What was your favourite? Governance Hot 100 board, influ board Influencer, Power List 100 Most Influential Black People, Joint winner of the 2022 Burberry uh, British Diversity Awards, Inspirational Role Model of the Year, Honorary Professor of Law at the Dixon Poon School of Law at King's College London, and the University's 2022 Distinguished Alumna of the Year. You took me as your guest to the dinner. Thank you for that. Or number five, an Honorary Doctorate of Law from Keele University and the University of East London for your outstanding contribution to law and for your commitment to promoting equality and diversity within the profession. That's a lot. Which of those five? Choose one. <laughs> I'm not sure I could choose one because they, <laughs> every single one of them made me cry. Um, okay. You know, so Governance 100, Hot 100 was the first accolade that came in. Um, you know, the fact that my picture appears outside King's College Strand campus, um, you know, absolutely um, is amazing. The fact that people call me, despite it's an honorary doctorate, the fact that the pe that people call me Dr. Uh, I, Stephanie Boyce, I mean, all of those and again coming from the humble background and still you know um you know when i'm at home and i see a, a couple of um uh, i've got to give a shout out to, to simon acres who joins us um simon and i have known each other from since i think we were teenagers but but simon's more like uh, his family he's 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 my brother um but just thinking about my journey um and all the the the, the, the obstacles um and you know all of the things that I had to navigate uh, to get those accolades, to get here. Um, and when I became the 177th president, 
the sixth female, the first black, the first person of color, going back to what you were saying earlier, you know, to become president of the Law Society. And do I feel, did I feel that pressure um, to be a role model? Being president gave me a remarkable platform. It propelled me in ways that perhaps would have taken me a long time to do. I felt it was my mission, my, uh, you know, it, I had to do something with that. And I could have sat there and, you know, just enjoyed the journey and not have done much um, other than enjoyed the journey. But that was never my, uh, that was never mine to do. I had to do something more and I had to do it differently. And you did. Thank you. That was the end of my questioning, Jagdeep. I could talk forever, but um, let's stick to time and let people ask their questions. Oh. That's great. Thank you. I am here. <laughs> Luke, can you bring me back? Thank you so much. That was uh, that was fabulous. Sorry, I, I was sort of in a bit of a daze as well. Stephanie and Joe, just sort of listening to you guys, and uh, yeah, what what a what a journey and what a what a story. Um, we've got there's there's a couple of um, comments in the in the in the chat box. Um, so one is actually from uh, from a careers advisor from the Pathway Group, um, and basically Stephanie, it's it's for yourself, and it says a teacher referenced an organisation saying why would they be at our school? Our students won't apply to them. They aren't aspirational. The college was made up of students from minority groups. We know all that too well. If you can't see, you can't be. It. What would you advise that this thinking is positively challenged? Well, absolutely. Well, I, you know, I remain disappointed to hear that that, that type of uh, thinking um, continues because that's exactly what I was told. You know, um, you know, you'll never be a solicitor. You know, and, and so forth and so forth. But, but, but teachers are telling continuing to tell our children um whatever you know it, that's not their position to to tell my work our work is about raising aspirations so that if teachers or whomever and, and it's not just teachers who do it we know others do it in the profession we know that some of this is in our homes in our communities so for me, it's about raising aspirations so that when individuals part, impart that information, it bounces off of our backs like water off of a duck's back. Can I, can I add something, Jagdeep? Um, in relation to apprenticeships in particular, to try and counteract any lack of knowledge with very you know, time pressured teachers and home, we are planning to do as part of the city collaboration um, some really sophisticated um, outreach using not going to uni and um, UCAS to make sure that the message reaches young people directly through TikTok, through Instagram, through all the channels that they use um, and we can get it to them directly because as far as I'm concerned with apprenticeships into law the only downside at the moment, the only problem, all the prestige nonsense that's gone away, it's just raising awareness. That's that's brilliant. Thank you very much. And just a, a comment from Justine Johnson, who I believe you went to see Joe in, in Birmingham from the, I did. From the ladder, uh, just saying that you did go down and see. And there's a um, there's an article that was featured in the in the local newspaper, the Birmingham Mail, that she sent a, a link to. Thanks for sharing that link, Justine. Has, has anybody got any um, any questions for for Stephanie or Joe that they'd like to to put in the chat? Um, it is it is probably a one and only time that we, we get Stephanie here. So yeah, exactly. Please, please utilize this time. Uh, Can I make two quick comments that I forgot to yeah. say while um, I was speaking with Stephanie? Why people think of any more questions they may have? One um, in terms of the Sutton Trust, which was one of Stephanie's chosen charities, um, I've um, become connected to their new um, head of apprenticeships work called Jane, and I, I met her in person at an amazing apprenticeships event this Monday. So while they've always um, had an element of apprenticeships work to their work, it's now been bolstered, which is really exciting to hear. And the second thing is, yeah, absolutely correct. And very excitingly, there is going to be a barrister um, apprenticeship. And I'm having coffee tomorrow morning with one of the co-leads for that. So, yeah, that's very exciting. And we will make sure that the work we're both doing is, you know, we stay linked up because it's important to always be linked up. 
again that's that's absolutely fabulous news joe for the um for the sector for uh for obviously the profession and and, and you do some absolutely brilliant stuff okay yeah, sharon's asked for her surname i think it's lilliman jane lilliman and she was at the conference on monday that you and i were both at um but i'm of an age where i forget names <laughs> aren't we all <laughs> <laughs> Can I say, uh, Jack D, um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and my apologies um, uh, for the technical issues experience. But can I say, if there are no questions, um, the one thing that I would say is that, you know, um, I couldn't have done the work, the remarkable work that I did um, as president without colleagues at the Law Society, without the members of the profession. My work continues in as much that um, it was my driver that actually that what we were doing, what we do becomes contagious, that we're passing the baton on to enable others to do it. Um, because as I say, diversity is found every and anywhere. And it's important that city firms, and Joe and you and I have spoken because whilst you're starting with city firms, you know, my background is in-house and we've spoken about in-house and how that may um, uh, filter down to medium, smaller firms and so forth. The whole point for me is to make law accessible. We suffer from a deficiency in this country around the public's knowledge of uh, legal or the law. Um, because for me, legal rights mean absolutely nothing. If people don't know what their rights are, and they don't even know when those rights are being taken away, that drove me and has been my lifelong passion to ensure that the voiceless are enabled to, to, to have their voice heard. But I leave you with something uh, that has driven my career and served me well throughout my career. And that is, every door is open if you push. You persevere until something happens. I love that. That's just a fabulous, fabulous way to end that, Stephanie. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I was going to ask, but you've probably answered my question in terms of what your, your three top tips are really in terms of trying to raise the agenda and... and and really you know, change the dial really on this subject. And I think you've you've been fabulous in terms of what you've just said and obviously your closing comment as well. Do you want me to answer Rachel's question? Do we have time for that? Can yes. Have, yes. Yeah. Um, so in terms of networks, um, I will come to that before. Um, Stephanie's quite rightly just flagged in her, her subtle way that um, we are talking, I'm talking about City of London uh, solicitor apprenticeships. But we're doing that because they need to catch up. And I speak as an ex-city law firm uh, solicitor. They need to catch up with the work that's been done around the country. Um, so City of London is playing catch up, not the other way around, as you as you gently suggested just then, Stephanie. Um, and I'm pleased to say that on our spearhead group, we have international law, uh, sorry, national law firms such as Evershed, Sutherland. <clears throat> and we're also, you know, um, absorbing knowledge from all sorts of firms that have been doing it for a long while. Muckle, for example, who've done a collaboration up in the Northeast. And we're very, very keen to learn from all those firms. But to answer Rachel's question, does doing an apprenticeship rather than going to university disadvantage you when it comes to networks? Um, I feel really, really passionately about networks for two reasons. One, coming from a low socioeconomic background, I had no network. And, and yes, I felt it. And actually, Actually, I'm not sure that going to university really helped improve my network. Um, but secondly, I am a very sociable person and I see the power of my network and the impact it can have now. And I want every single solicitor apprentice to have that, that power of that network. So it's, there are too many to discuss now, but we have all sorts of initiatives going on. Um, just to choose one, um, the only you're quite right because the cohorts of solicitor apprentices are smaller than the sort of the baked in grad cohorts we need to make sure that the firms work together to create a cohort of cross firm solicitor apprentice groups and I'm really pleased to say that as part of this initiative and even before that when I formalized it I had a word with the managing partners and said can we do something and like straight away Norton Rose Fulbright went yeah well why not um We'll do something on our roof. We'll introduce, we'll invite solicitor apprentices from all the different law firms. Doesn't matter whether they're from our firm or not. So um, the law firms are onto it. The Association of Apprentices is onto it. 
grassroots, the solicitor apprentices themselves are very much onto it. You know, there's someone called Amy Marin who's leading it out of BPP University. Um, and my job I just see is just to connect them all and make sure the law firms cough up the money, basically. Thank you very much. That's great. And um, yeah, I think I think we're good. I don't think there's any any sort of further further questions in the in the chat. There's a there's a, there's a few comments, um, but again, just really really want to thank you very much for you both to to come in and Stephanie. It's it's been a real honour and a privilege. As I say again, and thank you for your time. I know how precious that is. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Stephanie. You. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. So thank you very much. I'm going to try and get my slides to work again, but they don't really seem to be seem to be working for some for some reason. Um, but next we have uh, Tony Wilson, um, who's from the Institute for Employment Studies. He's a director there. I've known Tony a, a while and um, he's a real sort of thought leader in terms of the sector in employment and skills in the economy um and to be and to be honest with you if if, if tony doesn't know i don't think many people do so uh, he, he's uh, he's absolutely great and uh, we've worked together as i say in in previous roles and and so thank you very much tony for joining this again you know a real honor for you to be here and uh, thank you for your time Can well, I... thank you, thanks that's a very welcome. kind um very kind introduction um uh thank you so it's, this is going to be a bit a bit different to be honest i've really enjoyed this session it's been fascinating and really interesting and really inspiring too um and it's it's been it's been great to hear actually you know really quite different um perspectives too well obviously some common themes but you know different perspectives and re reflecting kind of different um uh there's different sorts of jobs that we do our different experiences and so on um really helpful and interesting but like i say what i'm going to talk about is something slightly different but i will try i will definitely try to um try to relate it back which was um jagdeep had asked if i could just sort of step back a little bit and talk about the kind of the employment and skills landscape that we're in i'm mainly focused on kind of the employment landscape i suppose um and where we are on where we are in the um labor market and in um uh and in employment um uh Oh, there we go. So I, so I just click here, do I? It must be show. Let's try that. See if this works. Um, uh, where, where we are on the labour market and where we are on um, uh, on sort of employment policy mm -hmm. and delivery too. Oh, it doesn't seem to be sharing. I'm sure it's going to come up any second. No, it's showing your slides, Jagdeep. I can't. Um... Yeah. Have you got Tony's slides? Yeah, they're just here. It says, oh, I press, oh, look, I pressed the wrong one. That'd be why. Oh, maybe I can share my own. Uh, sorry, I, I shared. Yeah, I can see what it did. I, I saw the one that was called Tony, so I shared that, but that was your, um, your uh, introductory one. Uh, bother. Let me see. I can't see it there. Um, tag deep. Uh, yeah, can you? Tony, we're just uploading your slides. Uh, and hopefully we can, um, we'll be able oh, look, to. I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm doing it now as well. So hopefully it will, it will work any second. So look, while I wait for that, I'll just introduce myself. So I'm Tony Wilson. I'm the, um, yeah, the director at the Institute for Employment Studies, and we um, we're an applied research centre. So we very much focus on the applied bit, and we um, we deliver in sort of research, analysis, and consulting on really anything to do with the labour market, employment and skills, and um, human resources, um, and, and sort of you know HR management and practice. So about two thirds of our work and our staff work specifically on issues around public policy and service delivery, and about one third work on them um, on issues which are more related oh, there we go more related to um uh management and practice within firms so working with employers and employer bodies so if you can see this which i hope you can so i can see it um the emphasis yeah is on the applied bit uh of applied research um and how we work so let's see
Now, annoyingly, this was going to be a really cool slide with lots of animations, which would have popped up with uh, showing how how the pandemic has changed. So you just have to imagine that you've been dazzled with um, with <laughs> the series of headlines over the three years, over the last three years since uh, since early twenty twenty. But what I but really the gist of what I was trying to show here was how uh, how the world has changed over the last couple of years, and and how if we were having a conversation about the landscape and about the future three years ago, two years ago, one year ago, even a few months ago, it would have been very, very different. So, you know, I think we all expected that the pandemic, many of us expected the pandemic was going to lead to a crisis of, of, of mass unemployment and disadvantage, that we potentially face higher levels of, of unemployment, long term unemployment than we'd ever seen, um, certainly seen since um, since the 1930s, Great Recession, and that would have Great Depression, and that would have had you know, lasting social and economic impacts for all of us on 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 um, on partic you know, particularly affecting people who are more disadvantaged in the labour market. Yeah, you know, as it is, you know, through you know through um because um you know because we're, we've been able to the government was able to protect a lot of jobs, but also because employers and civil society and organisations working with people all stepped up and helped people who are further from work and more disadvantaged and because you know the economy you know, we, the economy recovered as as um, restrictions eased we're actually facing very different challenges now as you will all know around firstly around you know labor shortages and skill shortages um which are you know which have been driven by uh, the big sort of structural changes we've seen in the labor market Secondly, like this growing cost of living crisis, which has hit us particularly over the last year, and is I think we think I'll say in a minute is developing I think into a cost of working crisis for many people on low incomes. But now we you know seeing the early signs of a slowdown in the wider economy. So very different challenges to what we thought, and so it's quite it's a very sort of difficult landscape for us to sort of interpret and understand and sort of work in. The only thing that's certain is that it's very uncertain. But I think there are some really important things we can do to prepare for. The future even if we can't predict it and it's going to focus on really four key points today which i'll run through in about 15 minutes really one is these how how many of the issues we've talked about around around disadvantage and inequality also affect us out of work and in work um secondly though how our economy is running at very different speeds in different industries and in different parts of the country and you know, many of the challenges we're facing is around how we can close those gaps and how we can how we can support those who are who are who are missing out or losing out as a result of that. Thirdly, I think I would like to focus a bit on the cost of living and in particular kind of unequal impacts this is having. And many of you will be experiencing. Comes up again and again in our work with people who deliver services, employment services and employment policy. Um, just how far this is now affecting people's experiences of support, the jobs they're able to do and the help that they need. And then I'll focus lastly on what we can do about this um, in reforming our services, but also things that we can do. So first part, what's going on in the labour market? You know, this is the biggest, what we've seen over the last couple of years is the biggest change, the biggest shift, paradigm shift really in labour force participation that we've seen at least 30 years. For the first time in 30 years, the number of people in work is flatlining, has fallen and is flatlining. Um, and we've had three decades of pretty much continuous growth in the size of the labour force through thick and thin, through recession and recovery. This is number of people in work or number of people looking for work. And now, you know, the dotted line shows what would have happened broadly if that pre-pandemic trend had continued. Be, there'd be about a million more people in work. And we can see this in the headline numbers that fell, it crashed during the pandemic, not as much as it might have done, um, but it nonetheless fell really significantly. And it hasn't really recovered. It, it looked like we were perhaps going to see a V-shaped recovery last year in 2022. It's now dropped off again and looks pretty flat. And what we've seen, in fact, is quite significant rises in economic inactivity, which is a horrible phrase. And forgive me for using it, but it's a, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's a better one, but it's, it's, um, it's where people are out of work and not looking for work or not available for work. So not unemployed. If you're unemployed, it means you're looking for a job and you're available. People, um, people who are in this economically inactive group, they're active in all sorts of ways, um, looking after family, uh, students, um, me, you know, many people contributing in other ways through volunteering and so on, but not participating in the formal labour market. And we've seen really significant growth in that, which is the third box over here on the right since the pandemic. And I just wanted to, and so firstly, you know, I think it's really important to understand sort of what's happening before we then talk about what this means, particularly around more disadvantaged groups. A lot of the discussion and a lot of the debate tends to be around where have all the workers gone? 
um, as and and the framing is really important because we're all kind of focused, overly focused on this idea that people have left the labour force. But the labour market is all about flows, and the flows go in two ways: it's people leaving work, but also people coming in, people joining the labour force. And actually, it's a the real challenges we're facing is that people aren't entering the labour force rather than that people are leaving. And the four key factors that are affecting that. Firstly, and these aren't in order of importance, they're all important. But firstly, we've got fewer young people overall because we're getting older as a population, but also because people are staying in education for longer. So the size of the youth labour force has fallen from nearly 4 million to just 3 million in the space of just 10 years pretty much unprecedented change. And this makes a really big difference because it's young people who move in and out of jobs all the time and we often grease the wheels on, on jobs that, that, that now we're finding really hard to fill. We've also got quite significantly lower migration post-Brexit. It used to be that best part of a quarter of a million people a year. There was a growth of, beg your pardon, there was a growth of about a quarter of a million in the number of people in the labour force who were, from, uh, who were born outside the UK. But that's now fallen. It was still population still growing, but it's growing by a lot less. So over the cumulatively over the six or seven years since the, since um, Brexit, about half a million fewer migrants we might have had if if the if the trend had continued from the previous decade. We also have quite significant growth in the number of people managing long term health conditions. Two and a half million people are out of work primarily because they've got a long term health condition and they're staying out of work for longer. And the fourth big factor is we're getting older. But also, people, older people are less likely to return to work now than they were before the pandemic. And while the pandemic has catalyzed some of this, these are actually much broader, longer term changes. They're permanent structural changes. I'm sort of tried to illustrate it here in some work we published last year. This shows the growth in the number of people who are economically inactive by the length of time since they last worked. And then the colors are the different reasons why people are economically inactive. So, in particular, what it shows is that the big growth has been in people who've been economic who last worked three or more years ago which is a third bit over or who have never worked which is a fourth bit over and on the never worked group this is primarily students that's what the light blue shows is students so quite a lot of students who've never worked as you'd expect and that's gone up but the dark blue in both never worked and people who last worked three or more years ago is people with long-term health conditions really significant growth in number of people with long-term health conditions but it's people it's not people who've left work during the pandemic it's people who were already out of work and are now longer and longer out of work or it's people who simply never worked at all which is often young people i'm really worried in particular about young people with health conditions and young disabled people other factors here are things like caring which has actually gone down a bit overall and retirement is another factor, but retirement has primarily been a relatively small increase for people who worked, you know, in the more recent past. And the bigger picture, the really important picture when we're thinking particularly about disadvantage, I would just focus in particular on disabled people as a really significantly disadvantaged group and one that I think we all need to sort of focus on more and how we can make work more inclusive and accessible for disabled people, but also how we can better reach and support people who are disabled. Disabled people are two and a half times more likely to be out of work than non-disabled people. Um, when they're in work, they earn less money. Uh, and employment gaps for disabled people are widening compared with the wider population. They were narrowing slowly before the pandemic. They're now getting wider. But we also see really significant employment gaps. So the important thing here is the, um, the, the blue here is the employment rates for the whole population and then for different disadvantaged groups. But we also see significant gaps for people qualified below level two. We see significant gaps for um, ethnic minority groups. This um, this uses labour force survey data, which um, which can, if you like, it gives a combined uh, employment rate for all people who are from ethnic minority groups and um, and all people who are uh, who, who who are whites. But actually, within this, we actually see you know, quite significant disparities by 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 um, by ethnicity, by gender, um, to um, and, um, and and particular groups who, who are quite significantly more disadvantaged. Um, and, and worrying, what's really worrying about this too, is that actually we're seeing employment employment gaps widening for quite a few groups. For lone parents, employment gaps are widening for the first time in about 30 years. Um, and they're widening for older people too for the first time in decades. So actually things are getting worse rather than better. And, um, and we can see this really clearly in the data on employment disadvantage. But I would say that place really matters in this too. And often I think matters more. Um, this shows employment rates by area and the darker um, areas are, are places where which have lower employment rates overall. So we see really wide disparities between areas. Um, and in particular, it's ex-industrial, coastal and urban areas who often fare worse. 
um, and men, and often many areas, many areas that are more disadvantaged have more people who are disadvantaged because of their health, because of their age, or because they're disabled, or because they're from um, an ethnic minority, or who are also from an ethnic minority group. Um, and there's a range of research, and I think this matters in particular because a range of research, including research that we've done, the Social Mobility Commission, you know, a lot ha has shown that people want overwhelmingly people want decent, secure, rewarding, and local work. Um, and I think often public policy is more focused on how do we create whizzy new jobs in disadvantaged areas, leveling up broadly defined, rather than how do we make the jobs that people do better, more secure, more rewarding, and how do we help people to be help people better access that work in their local areas, in their local neighbourhoods. Um, and in a final point, really, just on this is, is in the long run, you know, this this challenge around um, it's an opportunity around uh, around population aging means that it's uh, you know making work more inclusive is a is an economic and a social and political necessity. Not it's not a luxury. You know, there's a million more people who are in their fifties um, right now than are in their their forties or in their twenties, and with migration slowing down. This creates issues around, de around the so-called dependency ratios, the number of people who are working and supporting people who aren't working. But actually, more importantly, you know, society is changing and people are getting older and, and we all have to get better at supporting people to stay in work longer, to return to work when they're older, to change careers as they as they get older and recognise that this also means people are more likely to have have work limiting health conditions, have things that things where they might need support, they might need to work more flexibly or work differently. And I wanted just to just share one bit, one sort of bit of insight, which I think is super interesting um, from work that the yeah, Office of National Statistics did. But I'm thinking particularly around what might bring people back into work. There's a bit of a defeatism and doom and gloom that a lot of the people who are out of work would simply never return. Um, the reality is about three quarters of those who left work during the pandemic have said they would come back. Um, three quarters of those in their 50s, I should say, who left work during the pandemic have said they would come back to work, They even where they're not looking currently. And the reasons, the things that they want, this is uh, this is a decent sized survey conducted in, in um, um, conducted in the autumn. Is a job in the right location comes out of top um, that suits skills and experience that offers flexibility. Pay is important, but pay comes fourth in this list of the factors. And then there's other factors here too around working from home, around permanence, and so on. But fundamentally, where it is, it's a good fit and it's flexible. Flexibility is like the golden thread in how we support people out of work. I'll come back to that. Second big area, God, I'm taking too long, I'm tired, but second big area is around this economy that's running at different speeds. The important part here, I'll describe this a bit later, actually. The important part here is that vacancies are above um, where they were pre-pandemic in every single industry, and they're higher than they, nearly every single industry. There's one actually wholesale where they just dip below um, nearly every industry. And they're generally higher across the country, actually. And actually, one of the more interesting, remarkable things about the pandemic is that is that actually we've seen often more disadvantaged areas have, have employment has held up somewhat better than it has in, in like London, the southeast, for example. Um, and we've got really significant levels of hard to fill vacancies. And so this is hard to fill vacancies from the CIPD employment outlook stands out in particular public services, really hard to fill. Um, what well, we can know why that is in public services, massive demand and pay is falling behind. Um, but overall, um, a third of firms are anticipating that that their inability to fill vacancies will cause them significant problems in the next next um, few months. And overwhelmingly, these are because of skill shortages, um, often in relatively higher skilled work. But also there's labour shortages, straightforwardly. You know, one fifth of firms can't fill jobs because, uh, sorry, one fifth of unfilled vacancies, hard to fill vacancies because there just aren't enough candidates. And that's quite a different picture on different industries. It's worth, worth more of a dive into than I can give it here. But I'd also say there's quite a significant shift post-pandemic, which aren't often reported on, towards more highly skilled work. And this often gets a bit lost. So I don't really like this kind of high skilled, low skilled um, classification, but I'm using it for want of anything better. But this is, is an occupational classification where things that begin one, two or three are generally considered kind of professional, higher skilled jobs. Four, five and six is often more administrative work and skilled trades, but also includes social care, for example, which is a very highly skilled job, um, uh, but is, is captured here in this kind of middle group four to six. And then seven to nine is lower skilled work. A lot of hospitality, retail and manual work is there. And about now, for the first time pretty much ever, half of all people in work are working in what, what are defined in these terms as high skilled jobs. And about one in five are in low skilled jobs. So we are seeing the pandemic has accelerated a shift towards a relatively higher skilled 
workforce. Um, but that comes with challenges too. And that includes our ability to help people to access those jobs. We have a lot of vacancies in relatively higher skilled jobs, but there's lots of planning and thought needed in how we can support those transitions. Um, but also that isn't the case everywhere. And this shows again, so I've shown here in dark is areas with rel where relatively fewer jobs are in that high skill category. In some cases, it's a quarter rather than a half. And lighter is areas where it's relatively more. The picture kind of speaks for itself. It's a really strong overlap with the areas of lower employment as well tend to have fewer high skilled jobs. We did a really interesting bit of work on this for local government association, which also showed more likely to have jobs at risk of automation, more likely to have jobs that are going to less likely to have jobs, you know, technology jobs that are going to grow in the future, less likely to, to have had employment growth in the past, all sorts of issues which tie up this kind of the disadvantages that people face and the wider kind of economic picture that can lead to fewer jobs opportunities. I don't want to be entirely doom and gloom, there's lots of opportunities too, but but it can be really, you know, it can be di very different and difficult in areas where the labour market is more disadvantaged and the labour force is more disadvantaged. Final point though here, I think is important to reiterate, we do have to make all work better. You know, the and I do worry too much public policy is focused on trying to create high skilled jobs everywhere, rather than trying to just make sure we can find, you know, decent, secure and rewarding work wherever you live. And if you're in a, 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 a crap job, a, dis, a poor quality, low skilled, insecure job in the southeast, it will feel much the same as it does in the northeast. Um, it's just there are fewer people in that in that situation. And I would just say a point of worry here. So the vacancies picture, so the, the yellow line here is the pan post-pandemic peak of vacancies and the blue line is the current picture. And just compared to the peak, we are actually seeing vacancies falling now in a range of private sector jobs and private sector services. Some of this is an adjustment back towards normal, more normal levels. But some of it too, I think, is the early signs of a wider slowdown in the labour market, slowdown in the economy. Technology jobs stand out. You know, we all know the bubble is bursting, has burst. Hopefully that's just a readjustment in digital and technology jobs. Professional jobs are down, hospitality, manufacturing, um, admin and support services too. And the next slide is too detailed probably to read, but we'll send the slides out as well. I hope we will anyway. Um, and, um, or you can pause it on the recording and have a look. But there's a range of kind of early indicators which we report on, well, the ONS reports on, and we kind of um, try and reanalyze and put in our own briefing every month in the labor market data, the labor force survey, labor market statistics analysis. So you can find that on our website or on our mailing list. Short term unemployment is rising, redundancies are rising, vacancies are falling, and youth worklessness is rising. There's now a million young people out who are out of work and not in education. It was as low as about 850,000 just a few months ago. And you can see in that bottom left one, you can see it's, it's spiking up again, particularly driven by unemployment, but economic inactivity rising too. All of this is quite worrying. Should say, we're nowhere near where we were in the pandemic or indeed in the previous recession, but quite a few indicators going the wrong way. Third point, I think I will have to rattle through this, unfortunately. I just wanted to focus a little bit on cost of living because I think this gets a little bit missed when we talk more broadly about what's going on in the labour market or about employment and so on. Yeah, gosh, in, high inflation is hitting, is hurting all of us, but there are some groups who are far more likely to be poor than others and so are facing really significantly greater effects from rising living costs. And the fact that those living costs are particularly affecting food and energy means that larger families, for example, and disabled people, again, disabled people, are you know, really significantly disadvantaged because they're less able to turn the thermostat down or to or to you know feed their kids less, or whatever it might be. But you know, one standout fact here, which does get a bit lost, I think, is like family size really matters too. Nearly half of families with three or more children are in poverty. Um, and that, you know, in large part reflects changes made to the benefit system in the last decade that penalise um, larger families. And this just kind of shows how it matters. There is just no breathing space if you're on a low income. This is the bottom. This shows the sort of quintiles of income distribution. Weekly household spending is in blue. Weekly household disposable income is in yellow. If you're in the top quintile or, or near the top, actually, yes, live, you know, rising living costs make a difference. But often there is scope to meet that without it leading to you know, you know real hardship. If you're in the but this is 29 this is 2021 data 2020 2021 data so it's kind of pre the big rises in inflation there is no breathing space at all if you're in the bottom fifth 
And interestingly, survey work we did with employers tells us this is their top issue too. How do we respond to cost of living increases? Top workforce issue. So we polled employers, YouGov polled employers for us around top workforce issues. We thought it was going to be about job shortage, uh, about labour shortages. Labour shortages actually came forth here. The top issue was cost of living and how do we help our staff? Followed by skill shortages, followed by retention, followed by labour shortages. Now, Final point though, I wanted to make was just around employment support. We've launched a big commission on the future of employment support, really keen to involve people in that and for you to tell us what you think. But we think, I think, reforming our employment support and services has a really critical role to play. Fundamentally, how do we help people who want work to find work? How do we help employers to fill their jobs? How do we support better retention and progression? How do we support better partnership? And how do we do that through more effective partnerships locally with wider services and within industries? So we set out in this Commission on Future Employment Support these sort of five key functions for people, for employers and working with partners. And we talk to you there about what's wrong with our employment services at the moment. Job Centre Plus often gets a really bad rap, but I would say it helps a lot of people. Two million people a year become newly unemployed and, uh, and start new claims in the Searching for Work group of Universal Credit. And this shows those volumes, year, um, uh, month to month, I should say, over the last two decades, massive growth in the pandemic, um, which 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 they successfully managed. Um, so it's a you know it's an effective system to some extent, an effective system in dealing with those initial early stages of unemployment. But when you then get into support for people who are further from work who are more disadvantaged, which is often delivered through contracted out programs, funding has been going down and down and down over a decade. It's also really fragmented. It's really patchy difficult to access often, badly targeted, rose a bit in the pandemic. This is our analysis, I think. Um, yeah, it is. Um, rose a bit in the pandemic, but even not even to where it was in the financial in the last recession. And it's coming down again now. And it's a really complicated landscape. This is from work I did when I was at Learning Work Institute, working with the local government association, trying to map, you know, seven different this is just for young people, about 10 billion pounds at that time being spent, seven different accountabilities dozens of commissioners, dozens of, of delivery organisations across a whole range, delivery means across a whole range of different priorities, massively complicated and fragmented landscape, which is made worse by crises. This is just some of, I think, the things, probably most of the things that have been commissioned uh, or started since the pandemic began. So if it's you know difficult for people to navigate, gosh, it's hard enough for, you know, it's even harder for many organisations to navigate and impossible for employers to make any sense of. So we need to spend more, we also need to do it, do it better. And fundamentally, our contention is not enough people access support. Virtually nobody who's economically inactive is getting any, is getting structured employment support because we've cut back so much on the provision that was available for that, European Social Fund and other provision. And even looking at those who are supported through Jobcentre Plus who are unemployed, like we estimate that about one in five, at most about one in Four, one in three are receiving structured employment support through Job Centre Plus. Go back two decades, it was well over half were, were bit of the unemployed being supported. Um, I'm going to have to get, rattle through. I'm going to have to skip this, I think. And often, often not very satisfied with the support they get. Is it just what I was going to say there? So we need to do better. So what do we do about it? Final point. Um, and I'm conscious, you know, we're a delivery audience here, and so some of these points may not be entirely uh, applicable, I suppose. But I do think when thinking about public policy. We really, really, but I think for all of us in what we do, we really, really need to focus on how we can raise participation in work. So be really focused on who is disadvantaged, who is out of work, why are they out of work, and what can we do to better help, to better reach those people and help them. We really need to improve how we reach people and how we also, you know, find the jobs that want people and link those two things up. On retraining specifically, I think we've got a bit of a Goldilocks problem. Um, we can have any training you want as long as it's an apprenticeship or as long as it's a sector-based work academy. What's missing is the porridge that's that's just right and um, that's in between. Really clear roles for both of those things, by the way. I'm not saying we shouldn't do them, but how we can actually provide it, you know, that intermediate employer responsive training, I think is gonna be really key. And we need to work much better with employers to help them fill jobs, but not just to look at their recruitment, but also to look at how they can make work better and try and help them think differently about flexibility, security, and workplace practice. And focusing on costs of living and costs of working, making sure people can access the support they're entitled to and we can provide some that simple support that will help people access work. You know, it's so important. I think there's six key things that all of us as employers can think about too, is knowing our own workforces. In particular, being able to talk about, you know, knowing our own workforces, you know, being able to talk about things like 
financial hardship and financial support, but also talk about people's experiences where, you know, as we heard earlier, where people are are, um, are from racially minoritized groups or um, or, are, or are disabled or have health conditions or older people. Um, flexible working fundamentally, you know, is the golden thread across all those who are out of work and would support many more people to come back into work is it would be greater flexibility. We all need to think differently about how we recruit think about those drivers of decent work. There's some really great work the HSE has done through its management standards on this, which I think every employer can, can take forward and, and we've, you know, we've benefited from doing. Um, and leadership really matters um, to you have to believe it, not just say it, I suppose. I think that'll do. Um, I wanted to share one thing that we've done recently around good work, trying to develop some top tips for local government and top tips for businesses, working with the local government association. There's some nice case studies here as well, but the a bit link there that you can follow and this is more on our commission on the future employment support which we'd love to hear about i've definitely talked for too long so i'm going to stop there thank you thank you tony um again so insightful so fascinating um your graphs are amazing as usual uh, and i know so sort of I, I had sort of three or four questions really but i think you've sort of answered them a lot i mean one was around sort of those economically inactive that i know we've we've spoken about in sort of quite a lot of depth in in sort of previous roles um and just talking about sort of you know the tight labor market is it a tight labor market or is the data sort of skewed but i think you've sort of answered those questions i mean mine is, is specifically around sort of apprenticeships and and predominantly the um the audience here um you know and obviously with the apprenticeship social mobility forum um so where do you think before i open it out to uh, to the attendees uh, where, where do you think apprenticeships can fit into sort of supporting economic growth, levelling up, you know, the, the current sort of economic climate? Yeah, it's a good question. I was conscious. Um, I was conscious I haven't really talked much specifically um, about about apprenticeships. Um, uh, so I think there's, there's there's a few things. One one is around is thinking around how we can make sure that we're thinking in targeting those apprenticeships. Now we're working with employers about the scope to be using the scope to be better supporting people who are outside the labour market and who may be disadvantaged in in the labour force. And I think you know we do tend to do that. Um, it's quite a large extent through a lot of the work that's already been you know already been done that, and that and that yourselves you know yourselves have done sort of um, champion too. And a number of the sort of major cities have um, uh, too. But I think that's a really sort of important point about how we can sort of sense check what we're doing that it's some you know that, that that it's still accessible to people with long-term health conditions for example to disabled people um to older people um the second i i think i think the second is uh, you know apprenticeships can be a really sort of powerful tool for support as we all know for supporting um progression and widening opportunities for people who are in work and so again you know thinking about how we can better um how we can ensure there's one point i didn't talk about in that in that final one about the six key things we can do actually the final point about how we make sure that we're having when we're having conversations with employers that we're also sense checking with them holding a mirror up that they're thinking about workforce planning and progression and talent management and talent development across the whole workforce older people often get missed out on this as you know from previous work um disabled people can as well people who are in low paid or low skilled work people who work part-time for example and i think many employers are struggling with you know with which labor shortages it is a mixed picture as you say but many employers are struggling with labor shortages and they're not looking enough at their own internal development and thinking about in particular the opportunities to better support people who are older or people who, who work flexibly who, work, who might work part-time friendships you know are a really i think are a really really powerful way to do that but they, there are issues with that too um you know around how we how we can deliver that more flexibly in a way that can fit around people's needs where they work part-time have got care and responsibilities where they might have a long-term health condition um so yeah but i think people uh, i hope i mean I, I don't know i think it's for, from uh, hope, hopefully more broadly some of the thoughts from the, around where we are in the labor market and the economy might you know might spark thoughts of people that the people themselves have about what we can do differently thank you tony that's fabulous. I don't think there, there are any, any any questions in the in the chat, and obviously we will be sharing the the slide deck um, with with everybody here. But Tony, thank you so much again. It's so insightful, so fascinating. Um, you know, I've heard you at scrutiny committees out, and you know, you presenting data and evidence to government, and and you know, shaping employment skills in a positive way for the future. So yeah, you're you're a real thought leader in the in the sector. So thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. You're welcome.
So we've just got to, I'm just trying to, uh, we've got 10 minutes left and I'm going to try and keep on time and apologies for, for sort of starting late. Uh, we've just really got some information on some of our initiatives. Um, so we'll start with um, the Festival of Apprenticeships, which is a sort of a, a careers fair for apprentices that we're holding three events for. So we've just got a, a short video that we'll play and then I can give you some further information on that. This has been a great event. The amount of energy and excitement that we're seeing from the participants and uh, the parents and the students who are coming to join us today is fantastic. Lots and lots of people coming through the door, lots of really intelligent questions from them as well. And I think for the employers that are here in particular, the opportunity to present their brands and uh, start to build their talent pipelines and their, their interests uh, as they go through this process is really, really valuable. So yeah, it's been a really, really excellent day today. The event's been really good. We're about halfway through the day. Uh, this morning we started with a talk on the main stage, which was very, very well received. Uh, so, sort of got a lot of people coming over to ask questions. We've given out all of our freebies, a lot of the leaflets that we had. Um, I've spoken to a number of different people. I feel like I have widened their eyes to the fact that this is an opportunity for them, and I think it's been quite a successful day so far. <laughs> So as you can see, really, uh, really great events. We we have three in total. Uh, just wait for the, the slides to come up, and then I can give you further information in terms of the dates and on when they on when they are. I can't even see them. Yeah, move to the next slide, sorry. Um, so yeah, showcasing opportunities for future talent. Um, next slide. So the, the sort of 10 people, uh, 10,000 people reached sort of online and in, in person, um, 150 employees and learning providers they were exhibiting. And we also engage with a lot of schools um, and colleges and 100 
plus community groups engaged as well. So these are the, these are three dates. So we have three. We have one in Birmingham, uh, and one in London, and one in Manchester. So Tuesday, twenty seventh of June, is in Millennium Point. The London one's on the twenty ninth of June, and Manchester on the fourth of July. And if you are interested, the 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 link and it's a gentleman by the name of Kasim Chowdhury who leads on that. And the link on that is um, we'll send out. So it's festivalapprenticeships.com that we can send that out to. And in addition to that, we've also got the Multicultural Apprenticeship Awards, uh, which are the highlight of um, I know a number of individuals and organisations where we sort of celebrate um, multicultural apprentices and, and uh, it's a great sort of party atmosphere, but really sort of celebrating that EDI and and social mobility across apprenticeships and some amazing individuals. Some of you may have seen uh, Jay Seeker yesterday. We we took him to the uh, the apprenticeship um, conference and he gave sort of a, a an insight really in terms of his journey through apprenticeships, particularly from sort of that multicultural element. So this is a fabulous event as well. And we're also looking for individuals and organizations to submit nominations for their apprentices. And we'll just play a, a short video regarding that. Celebrating talent and diversity, recognizing multicultural apprentices, their employers, and learning providers. Welcome to the Multicultural Apprenticeship Awards 2022 in partnership with Pearson. So congratulations to all of you for getting here at this point. So a big welcome to all of you. We've, we've had 300 applicants this year, our biggest number of applicants. We've, had, we've got diversity in the room, you've seen it. Small micro businesses, SMEs, macro businesses, juggernauts of organizations, you've seen the depth and breadth of organizations. You've seen it all here. And that's what we try and bring that true diversity of global Britain, the multicultural Britain. I can honestly say that the support we've had from Pearson over the past three years has been invaluable. Working alongside you over this time has just shown us just how much impact Pearson makes, not just here in the UK, but globally. I remember when Saf said he wanted to give an award to someone for overall contribution and straight away I knew who we were going to do it, you know, who it was going to be because of their journey. What they've been doing is just fantastic. It is. That, that is quite a, quite a long video and it's the highlights of, of last year's um, Multicultural Apprenticeship Awards and I think it, in total it sits for five minutes but just so really conscious of time. Um, so again, they are taking place in Birmingham, I believe, in October. Uh, I think it's the 4th of October they're taking taking place. Um, celebrating talent diversity through apprenticeships. Uh, obviously, recognising multicultural British apprentices. And then these are sort of the, the past winners so when, when it was in inception in 2016, all the way through to 2022 in Paris Small, who's an apprentice at Jaguar Land Rover, was the overall winner, but the many more sort of highly commended and winners in other categories who are, who are fabulous as well. And nominations are open and the website will follow in a second. And again, as I say, we will be sharing these slides. Great. 
And the last bit really is just to talk about sort of the, the Multicultural Apprenticeship Alliance, um, which is something that I lead on and just want to talk about in terms of what it is and, and, and some of the strategic stuff that we're, that we're actually working on currently. And if anybody's interested, then, then please contact me with regards to that. I'm just getting the slides up. Sorry, my system uh, has let me down at the most uh, important time. So the, the Alliance is, a, as I say, a membership organization uh, where we promote social mobility, diversity, inclusion, and equity in apprenticeships. So we're sort of broadening that as well to look at employability, pre-apprenticeships, and then also the multicultural community too. So it's formed in 2017 and, and across, and we're sort of looking at sort of three pillars really. One is about educating, um, one is about engaging, and the third sort of pillar is around policy and advocacy and see how we can influence regional and national policy. There's our sort of vision and, and mission and in terms of what, we, what we're looking to achieve and how we're looking to achieve it. And there's a couple of our patrons there. And just really want to talk about in terms of what we've done really over the over the past few months. We've we've done quite a lot. We've met with our patrons, uh, pushed a lot of content out on social media, as you may be aware, particularly on sort of LinkedIn. Um, but we're also doing quite a lot of strategic stuff to see how we can really move this up the agenda and change dial on uh, on EDI and social mobility across apprenticeships. So um, we held a, a local skills improvement plan roundtable that we led on with uh, with Comtry and Chamber. Uh, Coventry and Warwickshire Chamber, and that provide information and insights into how we feed into the, the regional and national um, LSIPs. And again, there'll be more opportunity to do that regionally and nationally. So please look out for that, that information. Uh, we're holding a, a workshop with future leaders from a financial institution um, on multiculturalism, EDNI, and the work that we do around that subject. We also get invited to a number of conferences and summits. We were at one yesterday, the, the apprenticeship uh, conference, where we, we were part of a, uh, a sort of a panel on the stage. Um, we were also at the IRSA conference, the EDNI summit from ELP, uh, the IEP summit, and, and, and others to follow. And we also part of the big assembly and, and other organizations who hold their sort of annual conference as well, such as Great Ormond Street Hospital, for example, where we presented. Um, and then we're also convening a round table. So we have a number of organizations um, who, uh, and senior stakeholders who really want to get involved in this subject. And we're convening a round table that is going to be led by Learning and Work Institute, but there's Association of the Colleges, ELP, IFAT will be part of that as well, and a couple of uh, combined authorities. And what we're looking to do with that is really implement some tangible actions in terms of how we can improve social mobility for the multicultural community within employment skills and apprenticeships. And if you do want to get involved, so if you want to join the movement and be involved in changing the dial um, on this subject, please get in contact with me. So we're pleased to know that's the that's the end of the slides. Um, just really some, some sort of final thoughts really for, from me. Number one is um, thank you to the to the speakers who came and presented, uh, giving up their time and um, and support and supporting this, um, it really has been fabulous. As I say, this is my second one, and we're looking to improve this on a on a sort of on a quarterly basis when we when we deliver these. Um, it's going to be a hard act to follow, but I'm sure we will. Um, and really, just trying to raise the raise the profile of this subject and work with some thought leaders who can really provide us some meaningful insights. Um, and, and lastly, really, is to thank you guys for attending and thank you for giving up your time and, and effort to, uh, to be involved in this. As I say, it's a really, really important subject. We can't tackle this alone. We need to do it collectively, collaboratively, in partnership um, to really change the dial and, and, and improve the futures for, for the multicultural community, but also to improve sort of socioeconomic issues and, and social mobility as well. So my last thought really is just to to thank you very much for attending. Uh, please get in contact with me on LinkedIn or via email. Um, we'll be sharing the link to uh, to the recording and to the presentations via a slide deck very, very soon. Um, and I hope to see you see you soon and, and let's contact. Take care. Bye-bye.